All right, we are starting this webinar. I'm going to go live on Facebook Live as well. If you're watching this on Facebook Live, you can join the Q&A at crowdcast.io slash pyware, or just click in the link, wherever that link is, I don't know. And uh, here we go. I'm Pyware, the, the director of Skin Deep and editor of Skin Deep, the battle over Morgellons. And this is next to me, Harry Quinn Schoen, who was featured in the, uh, in the film Skin Deep. Um, Harry, uh, you wrote a book last year, uh, Contested Illness in Context. Can you tell us what uh, the basics of your book is about? Um, sure. Uh, hello, everyone, um, first of all. Uh, the basics of my book, Contested Illness in Context, are that there's a whole group of, of illnesses um, not properly catered for by uh, medical diagnoses. They, they exist sort of either with very vague diagnosis, diagnoses um, or with totally inadequate diagnosis. And the book was about the, the consequences of this on patients um, and what happens when you don't have the validation and the legitimacy of a firm recognized medical diagnosis. So all of the issues that patients face um, with the people in their immediate surrounding, but also with issues uh, like uh, getting benefits, bureaucratic, governmental um, issues, health insurance issues, um, and the psychological tension that it creates to, to exist in a society that puts so much emphasis on, on, on the medical um, sort of establishment for legitimacy when it comes to to diagnoses um, and how that plays out on a personal psychological level when you're not able to get that. And so how does that relate to Morgellons disease? How did you get involved with Morgellons disease itself? So Morgellons disease is is just an example of, of a contested illness um, and it's it's a, what I would classify probably as a, as a highly contested illness. So contested illness um, for me, to put it in, in a kind of layman's layman's terms, um, is if you stop someone in the street and you said, uh, what do you know about this disease? Or, or you describe the disease a bit to them, they might ask you, um, is it real? Is this disease real? Um, and what people are normally um, sort of hitting on when they ask that question or where they consider a disease's realness is, um, is it physiological is it observable um is there some medical test that that we can do is it is it somehow seeable through medical apparatus or understandable under existing um medical frameworks and morgellons fits into this because um it is not uh as of yet understandable uh to the majority of 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 um, doctors or to the majority of the, the the medical establishment and it's it's contested along long lots of other a lot, lo lots of other lines as well so it has a, a highly contested uh, etiological picture people disagree about what causes it it has a contested symptomatic picture um, people disagree about exactly uh, what the symptoms are whether, whether uh, there are fibers coming out of patients skin or whether these are um, pieces of, of hair and cotton from from clothes or, or other environmental sources um, and it's it's kind of politically contested because um, there are patient advocate uh, advocacy groups who stage rallies and try and steer the narrative towards one particular understanding of disease and against them there are plenty of people who subscribe to a different model of disease um, and I mean, Morgellons is, is is evidently contested to anyone that has 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 looked into it, and and that's why it was it was kind of of interest to me. So, one of the things that I tried to do with the film Skin Deep: The Battle Over Morgellons is go back to the original definition of. Morgellons disease that was coined by Mary Lightow. That was the essential thing was um, talking about the fibers that were coming through the skin. 
And that was the defining characteristic of Morgellons disease. Um, and then represent that as the official definition. So joining us is Marianne Middleveen, a scientist, microbiologist. Uh, she's been studying Morgellons disease for over 10 years and was the first to, uh, she and her, and her collaborators were the first to show the infectious origins of Morgellons disease and that the Morgellons fibers were made of human structural proteins. And um, we've got, um, for you guys who are on the Q&A, we've got some questions that, or sorry, you have questions. And if you'd like to ask them, there is, if you look down at the bottom, I think it's reversed. So over there, you'll see the ask a question panel and you can submit your question there. Um, and then there are some polls for you to answer. And of course, there's the chat on this side of the screen uh, where you can chat and uh, say hi to each other and, uh, and follow along with the conversation. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Marianne, for coming. Thank can you, you much for having me. Can you catch us up with where we are scientifically understanding it uh, from your perspective, uh, Morgellons disease. Let us kind of give us an, an overview of where we're at right now. Sure, I guess um, what I do is separate what we know about the fibers and then separate what we know about the uh, infectious process that goes along with it. So as far as the fibers go, we know that they are composed of collagen and keratin. They may have an amyloid component and um, they originate from the human basal cell layer and uh, also from the deeper dermis. Um, they are human bioproducts. We also know that the blue fibers are colored in that strange blue color because of melanin pigmentation. And this has been shown by uh, several different methodologies. So as far as um, the infectious origins, we know that pretty much every patient that we have studied so far has had some kind of Borrelia infection. Some people also have a treponema infection, so treponema denticola, which is a human oral pathogen. Some also have Helicobacter pylori. Um, we also have detected Bartonella uh, henselae in tissue. So there's a few different pathogens that we can find in Morgellons skin. And these, um, you can find evidence of mixed biofilm formation. So predominantly we see Borrelia and that seems to be the you know, key uh, common denominator for um, infectious organisms. And we also know that spiroketal infection can cause the upshift in collagen and keratin production and has been shown in other models. So we actually are uh, beginning to understand more about the mechanism for uh, the formation of fibers and what is happening in the skin. Thank you, Marianne. And I know you've got a busy schedule today, so you could only join us for a little while. So if you you know, need to go, just pop on off. But uh, joining us now is uh, Dr. Courtney Day uh, up from Oregon, or down from Oregon, because I'm in, in, you know, around from Oregon. Um, yes. <laughs> okay, I'll just say goodbye then. Anyway, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, and, Marianne. Uh, yes, okay, thanks so much, Mike. All right, now we're in the triple split. Uh, thank you for coming on, Dr. Day. Uh, she, thank Courtney you for Day, having me. Yeah, my pleasure. You were a naturopathic, before you became a, a, an ND, a naturopathic doctor that's licensed in Oregon, I know you were a Morgellons patient and that you were inspired by, you know, these kind of tragic stories that you heard from other Morgellons patients and also by your own story where your dermatologist um, diagnosed you as um, self, you know, doing self mutilation and then described, uh, treatment as handcuffs. He thinks he told you that handcuffs were the proper treatment for you, which is sort of right. appalling. Can you um, sort of tell us your experience first as a patient and then becoming a doctor that treats this disease? Yeah, sure. Well, when I first um, got sick, there was very little known about the disease. Um, now we have a better understanding in its relationship to um, vector-borne diseases like Lyme disease. But um, 
yeah, back then there was very little known about it. Um, and at that point of time, I had uh, such a hard time finding a physician who didn't give me either a psychological diagnosis or some ridiculous idea, like put handcuffs on to um, be the solution. Um, so uh, it really um, inspired me to see what else was out there and brought me to naturopathic medicine as well as my journey into naturopathic school and then um, to be a physician and really um, I was so glad that I got to um, actually continue my education um, through out school as well as after school. Um, the Charles E. Holman Foundation has been instrumental in providing clinicians like myself the research that we need to understand um, you know, how this disease happens in patients and, and then also how to help them. So um, I'm just so, so um, glad to be a part of the organization as well as um, the cause for finding, you know, how do, how do we help these patients um, if it's not just all in their head? Thanks very much. So the way this works, I don't know if you guys, you guys have done Crowdcast before, but there, there's questions down here that uh, I'm gonna take a look at and, and we can answer it. And uh, if you're attending the Q&A, you can upvote the questions that you uh, want answered or you can pose your own. So I'm gonna jump to the first one here. Uh, Pi, what made you want to take on this subject? Did you know anyone personally affected? Um, so yes and no, I, I grew up with an uncle who had an ulcer and he would eat baby food at dinner. And that was, we kids we were like, why is Uncle Ray eating baby food? That's really weird. And his ulcer was so bad that it caused him to have a restricted diet. Now the treatment prescribed to him was psychotherapy because they wanted to uncouple this unconscious relationship between his brain and his stomach that his mother had created when he was a child, when he would cry and she would give him candy. And that was the, the reason why he had this ulcer. Well, that was the prevailing wisdom at the time in the, in the 1970s and 80s, when it was believed that bacteria could not survive in the gut because it was an too acidic an environment for bacteria to survive in. And a, a gastroenterologist in Perth, Australia named Barry Marshall found that actually 85% of all ulcers were being caused by bacteria, H. pylori bacteria, which I think uh, Marianne Middleton just mentioned is a possible uh, multifactorial source of Morgellons disease uh, tangentially. But Barry Marshall's research in the late 80s was not taken seriously, it was dismissed, and he, he had to basically create a, an interesting news story where he drank down a vial filled with that bacteria and gave himself an ulcer uh, to then be taken seriously because the, the general population started to change its idea once they sort of heard this crazy story of a doctor giving himself ulcers to prove that it was a bacterial infection. And so my uncle ended up dying, and he, he was never treated with antibiotics, but I thought, what a crazy thing, right? Where it's science and how could it be disputed? I thought scientists would just see new evidence and they'd look at it and they'd judge it on its own merits. There wouldn't be any kind of prejudice, but that's not how medicine works. And we see it in other things with chronic fatigue syndrome. We see it with, uh, we saw it with multiple sclerosis. Uh, we've seen it, um, you know, with chronic Lyme disease. And when I was researching chronic Lyme disease, looking into this kind of medical denialism, I saw Morgellons disease because about 6% of all Lyme disease patients develop Morgellon symptoms. So it's a big there's a big cross section between Lyme disease patients and uh, Morgellons disease patients, and most people seen who who most people who have Morgellons disease, I think it's one study was between 98 and 100 percent have Lyme disease, test positive for Lyme disease. So I saw Morgellons disease as like the ultimate example of something is crazy here. People have fibers coming out of their skin. And either they are totally delusional or the delusion lies within the medical industry who's just denying this new evidence. And I thought this story needed to be told. And that was the origin for the film. And uh, I, would, I went to the, I went and I filmed, you know, um, in fact, Sam Price Waldman, who's here in the audience with us. Um, he, he and I went to many homes where uh, Morgellons patients were, and we told their stories, including Cindy Casey, as you saw in the film, and um, Edward Hu, um, who you also saw in the film. And we went to the Morgellons Conference in Austin, Texas, that takes place every year, this year being a notable exception because of the coronavirus. Uh, and we filmed hours and hours and hours and hours of footage uh, with folks and found that they wanted their stories told. Once they learned to trust the cameras and that we would have an open policy where we would 
we would be empathetic, but we would present both sides of the debate. Um, they wanted their stories told. And so I was proud to, to present that in the film. And that's the story of the, uh, of the movie. And I, I was able to find uh, participants, um, including um, Dr. Day, who she doesn't appear that much in the film as we, we shot with so many people, but we had ended up making a, a little short film uh, about her story uh, that I hope you can, can see on Facebook or on her website, dailywellness.com. I think it's D-A-Y-L-Y, wellness.com. Got it. Um, but I, I know it's an interesting experience. Um, as, a, as a filmmaker, you always want to create uh, a quote unquote authentic experience where you just want to, you just want to hide, right? And just watch what's going on. But you have a giant camera and then I'll be holding a giant pole with a big microphone sticking down and pointing at you. And so it's, a, it's, it's you can't hide. You, you can't be the true fly on the wall. You have to be somebody who collaborates with the participants of the documentary. So I'm actually curious, like, what is it like on your side of the camera, uh, Dr. Day? What, what was it like to have cameras around um, the conference and, and, and sort of following you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, you're not used to having cameras really on you when you're doctors and collaborating with others. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I come from a background where um, I did a lot of theater and film growing up. So it felt a little more comfortable for me than I would think others um, felt during the process. But um, it really just helped to highlight uh, how important it is that as clinicians, we have constructive conversations. Um, that was one thing that I realized as the film, as the camera was there, it was a reminder that really this is our opportunity to collaborate and to try to understand um, best each other's research and findings so that we can ultimately help patients as best as possible. And so um, I was really um, glad that at least with the collaboration that I've had with researchers, for the most part, it seems like everyone is really making their best effort to best understand um, what we can understand. And it's obvious that there's still questions remaining to be answered, mm -hmm. um, but it looks like that um, for the most part, we have a good uh, group of physicians who are really dedicated to finding those answers. And, uh... Harry, what was it like for you to collaborate with the film? Have you done anything like that before? No, it was it was um, it was absolutely bizarre. To be honest, um, I, I I think that one of the the big things, apart from the the self consciousness that you feel being on being on camera, is that um, as an academic, when you're asked a question, there's a tendency to try and give very very long qualified answers with with lots of different caveats and um, the process of of kind of understanding that you wanted me to say the same thing but in 25 uh, percent as many words um took a while <laughs> took a while to get to get used to um but it was it was kind of fascinating for me as well because i I'd, I'd just been studying this basically in in london reading stuff you know in journals and and watching videos and various different kind of sources i had access to to then go and actually meet in person all of the various people that i'd I'd read about and the research that I'd read, that was very interesting from a from a personal point of view. So, so I think that this film brought together a lot of people um, and had them have conversations that might not have happened otherwise. In fact, I'm sure that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So you traveled a couple of times to the United States. What were the biggest surprises that you found when you went to, you know, an ILADS conference in Philadelphia or when you attended the Morgellons conference in Austin, Texas? Um, I'm trying to think. So the, the ILADS conference, um, there was, uh, actually, I, I, what, what surprised me most perhaps about the Morgellons conference, sorry if I start there, sure. um, was, was the strong sense of community and the strong sense of advocacy and, uh, un, you know, unfortunately or not, but certainly understandably, the strong vein of anger that was kind of fizzing below the, the surface of that, that, that conference in, in that it was a lot of people that felt um, that a disservice had been done to them um, because they had been uh, raised to believe that when they became ill, that they would get answers and that they would be looked after. And I think almost universally, they did not feel like that had happened. Um, and that gave them a kind of closeness 
that I, I maybe wasn't expecting. Um, the ILADS conference was a little bit more disparate because it was it was obviously the umbrella uh, of Lyme disease. And I think on a personal level, what I found interesting there was the amount of kind of treatments that were being sold. And some of them made me quite uncomfortable um, because with any condition like chronic Lyme disease or, or Morgellons, um, people get very desperate. And as soon as people are, are desperate, then there's a, a huge opportunity for, for exploitation. Um, and it was it was interesting for me to observe some of the treatments that were being offered there as kind of lifesavers, but at very high prices on a subscription model that you didn't seem to be able to get off. Um, and so that was maybe a little bit disheartening to see, but again, understandable. So you moderated at the Morgellons conference, the conversation, yeah. the, the presentation, the Q and A that happened after Dr. Feldman's presentation. Those of you who've seen the film, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who haven't, there is a dermatologist who is a skeptic who did not believe that Morgellons disease was um, a biologically sourced disease. Who believed that it was a, a delusion, um, you know, in part because some of his patients who claimed to have Morgellons disease um, would come in and say Satan was creating snakes inside their skin. Um, but he gave a, a somewhat of a tone deaf um, presentation, which angered a lot of folks talking about anger. Uh, what was that experience like, Harry? What did you take away from that kind of scene that happened uh, in the, in the film and in, at the, at the conference? Um, well, I guess, I guess, first of all, it was, it was a, a textbook example of how, how not to communicate, how not to build bridges um, because Fundamentally, I'm not actually sure that Dr. Feldman's um, message was was that much at odds with with uh, what people in the audience could understand. Um, however, the way that he delivered it and the tone that he delivered it and the uh, examples that he chose to use um, immediately uh, built a barrier between him him and the audience and and turned him into the caricature that I always try and say doesn't really exist. And, and whenever I'm having conversations about this, I always kind of go to pains to, to, to make it clear that, that the individual doctors 99% of the time are trying to help. And, are, are, you know, they, they wouldn't have become doctors if they didn't want to help other people and, and all this kind of thing. But in the case of Dr. Feldman on that day, um, I would have struggled to, to make that, that argument um, for sure. Um, but, as an experience, again, it, it was it was this 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 eruption of of anger, and you can you can look at that that anger and those, those questions and the people storming out and the the kind of like the the bear pit atmosphere and kind of view it as entertainment and isn't this isn't this fun and all these people are, are are so mad, or you can you can ask yourself why are they so angry and why are they gaining so much catharsis from sort of um, letting it out in this, this group setting. And that to me is the more interesting question. Um, sorry, go on. No, no, I was asking? just, um, I was going to ask actually to, to sort of segue over to Dr. Day who deals with patients all the time, mm -hmm. um, who used to be a, a patient herself. So, so, you know, we were talking about how presentation is everything like, you know, Dr. Feldman's core message might've been, mm -hmm more amenable to the Morgellons audience, but the way he chose to present it that day and to say things like there are no bad doctors, you know, they had no idea that how that would might uh, provoke a reaction to in an audience filled with people considering themselves abused by the medical system. What do you take into the, in, into the, um, into your clinic, into your office with patients um, that you might've learned from having Morgellons disease? Right. Um, well, I think the number one thing is just to be heard and understood. And you're completely right that um, there was a misunderstanding of his audience there. And um, really, the best clinicians, I think, are the ones who really understand their patients and where they're coming from. Um, so I, I think just having the advantage of going through the disease myself, I mean, going through the disease of myself is an advantage of me being a clinician and the fact that I can really truly understand a lot of the things that my patients are talking about um, that other clinicians might not be able to quite understand not having walked the walk. 
Um, but at the same time, I don't necessarily think that you have to walk the walk or have a disease to really understand it and be a great doctor. Um, as you can see, there's other clinicians who are treating Morgellons disease who have not gone through it themselves. And um, Ginger Savely herself hasn't had the disease, but she at least took the time to try to listen and understand what was going on with the patient so that she could best figure out, um, you know, how can we help this patient? Is this similar to another disease that we perhaps know about? And the connection with Morgellons disease and Lyme disease was instrumental, I think, in a, in a lot of ways. Um, but Unfortunately, we have a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to Lyme disease itself. Um, clinicians um, have a hard time sometimes just really believing and understanding the patient. Um, there's such a political um, arena around Lyme disease in this country, so I know that it, it, there's so many reasons for that. Um, but uh, really what I've got to take away from the physicians that I collaborate want, with and those mm -hmm. who go to conferences like ILADS is I really understand that most of those doctors um, got to the point where they are in their career by really listening to patients and um, getting complex case patient stories or complex cases that they really didn't understand and then started to make connections that, oh, maybe this is due to something like Lyme disease. And I, I hear so many clin clinicians tell me that um, as soon as they realize that one of their patients had Lyme disease in their practice, it opened their eyes to you know many more that could potentially have the disease and so um, there's a, definitely a lack of awareness but um, also it just takes the clinician who's really willing to listen to their patient and then investigate you know why it are they feeling the way that they are um, to get to the answers to uh, i think that we need with a disease as complex as morgellons disease mm -hmm. so for those of us those of you just joining us um, there are some questions down in the ask a question area. You can upvote if you want them answered by us. We've got 26 questions right now, and we've got only till about, we only have about uh, 45 more minutes. So we'll be struggling to answer uh, the ones that we have. But here's a, a real quick one, again, for you, Dr. Day. What medications are currently most recommended to treat Morgellons? Um. That's a good question. Well, uh, when it comes to the treatment of Lyme disease and the co-infections of Lyme disease, um, it's an evolving state of medicine. So we have typical treatments that we use um, based on CDC recommendations, um, but that's for uh, usually for acute cases. So when it comes to things like um, persistent infections or chronic cases, like uh, many of the Morgellons patients have, um, there's debate on what treatments are the best, actually. So um, th th I think that's one reason why we really do need more clinical research when it comes to treatment, especially now that we have more understanding of the associations and causes of the disease. Um, really understanding how treatments work the best would be the next step. Um, but we do have treatment um, clinical trials going on for patients with persistent Lyme disease. So I will utilize a lot of that information in my practice. So um, Dr. Horowitz, for example, has a clinical trial that he's done on agents like uh, Dapsone in use, being used with other antibiotics. Um, and then there is also um, the, a non-antibiotic approach to persistent infections, um, such as some of the co-infections and Lyme disease itself, um, using uh, things like antabuse or disulfiram right now in clinical trials. Um, so really, I take a patient-centered approach, um, and there, uh, that's part of the reason why I think it's so important that you, um, if you do have, thing, or if you think that you have Morgellons disease, that you get to a doctor who is trained in how to diagnose and treat tick-borne infections um, like Lyme disease, because it is such a complex situation that um, most of the doctors who do treat it take an individualized approach. That sounds great. And I know um, on our Tuesday Q&A, which you can watch here on Crowdcast, uh, Ginger Savely, another uh, a nurse practitioner who uh, has treated more Morgellons disease patients than anyone else, has had a, a, an initial approach where she would um, treat for Bartonella, like she would use the same antibiotics that, that she prescribed for Bartonella to treat Morgellons. And, there was, and there's been some success with that. And, and in fact, Edward Hu, who joined us for the first two Q and A's that you can again watch here on Crowdcast or on Facebook Live, uh, talked about his, uh, he had a rotating course of antibiotics 
Um, I don't know if he was specific about which ones, but um, I know Mary, not Mary Ann Middlebean, um, Melissa McElroy Fessler, a nurse practitioner in San Francisco, had prescribed those, and and they were very effective mm -hmm. for him. I mean, I know not everything, like you say, it needs to be an individual approach, uh, patient-centered approach, because what works for one patient doesn't necessarily work for another. And no, that, no, for that's me, a really, that's a good point. That for me was the big yeah. su was is the big surprise because I'm not a, a science guy. You know, I'm much more from a background of literature and film, and so. You, you, you're like, well, you know, if there's a disease, there should be a pathogen, and then you give it the one medicine that kills the pathogen and done, right? How is that not working, you know? And mm -hmm. what, what, what do you think, Harry? You're nodding over there. Like, what? that was kind of my naive understanding of medicine, the, the, the one pathogen and, and the single medicine approach, but it kind of got destroyed. What is, what is your understanding of, of, uh, of approach to medicine being a, a philosopher of medicine? Yeah, no, absolutely. This is another area in which in which um, Morgellons or, or or contested illnesses might might be said to be contested in their in their treatment regimes because um, part of the big the big uh, issue that the Morgellons patients face with with um, other members of the public uh, is that people have very strong expectations of what a disease is like and and, and what a medical kind of process is like and it, and it's exactly as as you described. Um, that you have X pathogen and it's treated with with Y um, antibiotic, or, or or it's observed using this one piece of medical technology, and we and we find that individual thing, that that alien thing to the body, whether it's a virus or bacteria or whatever, and we eliminate it, and then we go back to being well. Um, so it's a very reductionist, um, non-holistic view of of disease, and so when you have a condition um, like Morgellons, where there doesn't seem to be one particular treatment regime that that is effective for everyone because that doesn't fit into the logic of 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 how people understand disease to work um they they struggle to get their heads around it and they think oh maybe you have different things maybe you don't have anything at all maybe you have this other thing that that is not related to to what what you think it is um but that that actually is a sort of misunderstanding of, of how an awful lot of diseases work plenty of diseases have have differential um kind of symptomatic profiles depending uh, on individuals and lots of diseases require fine tuning of um treatment regimes it has to be said that diseases like morgellons and chronic fatigue syndrome you mentioned before and fibromyalgia and chronic lyme disease these have particularly extreme um, versions of this kind of idiosyncratic um, response to treatment um, but it's probably something to do with, with the, the way that the disease interacts between the mind and the body um, that, that makes it so hard to identify in the first place and makes it even harder to treat because it doesn't seem like there is a bacteria or there is a virus involved necessarily um, in a lot of these, these, these conditions. Um, and that just makes it obviously a lot harder to, to, to fit into our on our, our normal models of how diseases would work. Yeah, I I found the sort of one of the most interesting and complex uh, things about um, Morgellons disease is that there can be and about and about chronic Lyme disease is that there can be neurological symptoms, right? So if, for example, if you have syphilis, it's, it's well understood that the tertiary stage, the third stage is when the, the offending bacteria causes the infection, gets into your brain, and it causes a change in your mind and your, and, and your behavior. Uh, Al Capone is a kind of classic example of this. When he had it later in life, he would fish in a swimming pool because it had you know, kind of driven him a little crazy, this, this infection. So his, his mind was affected by a biological source, and that seems pretty easy to understand if you look at it in terms of syphilis, if you look at it in terms of a brain tumor, if you may have even had somebody in your family or, or a friend group that their relations, their behavior or thinking changed as due to a brain tumor or due to if you know somebody who had viral or, or, or bacterial meningitis, like that changes you and changes the way you behave. And so the, the, the most complex thing for me was understanding that, well, there could be a Morgellons disease patient who has a bacterial infection that's gotten to their brain and changed the way they behave um, and then arrives at a doctor's office and says some odd things and actually has Morgellons disease. 
but actually also might be delusional. Not, then that's not proof that it's a delusional disorder. It's proof that they have an infection that's gotten to their brain. That was the thing that kind of rocked me. And you can even see it play out in some of the patients that we, oh, yeah. that we follow in the film. Dr. Day, did you have any neurological symptoms when you were a patient? Um, I, I, not to the point where I had complete personality changes or anything like that, but um, definitely some neurological symptoms. Um, so it, it, I think it, a lot of us do end up getting, you know, heightened anxiety just from the fact that we're going through a disease that's misunderstood. So I definitely felt that and, um, and, and rode that way for a while. So mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that there isn't, there wasn't no, any um, psychiatric component at all to my case, but um, I was fortunate in the fact that I think that I caught it earlier than a lot, some patients um, that end up progressing to that stage. But it is difficult as a doctor because I, I do see that in practice, um, especially with patients who have had this for a long time, that mm -hmm. um, at, at some point there is that uh, a tendency for the mind to um, become a more height, heightened awareness as well as um, more driven to certain delusions. So I've definitely have had patients who I believe had Morgellons disease, but also had delusion delusions at the same time. Um, and yeah. so it was really complicated and hard to actually help some of those patients, as you can imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the questions for a sec. Here's an easy one or a quick one. Um, the question is, what happened to Mary Lito? Uh Well, Mary Lytow is, if you've seen the film or you've done a little research online, uh, Mary Lytow is the person who sort of coined the term Morgellons disease when she found a fiber in the lip of her son. And she was the big activist at the beginning of um, this whole Morgellons disease experience in I think the early aughts. Um, she created the Morgellons Research Foundation and it was, they had a huge letter writing campaign. You can see that in the film. Um, and then she, you know, she just kind of disappeared. Um, and so the question of what happened to her was it you know forefront in my mind because I asked everybody you know I asked Cindy Casey who used to work with her and and uh, Raphael Stricker and, and Ginger Savely what happened to Mary Lytow where is she why isn't she and can she be in the movie you know I wanted to <laughs> interview her obviously um, mm -hmm. but she had just cut off all contact so I finally found her last year um, and I called her and she made it real clear in a very quick conversation that she did not want to have anything else to do with Morgellons disease and you gotta respect that. So um, it's unfortunate, I think, when you're looking for activist leaders to, to raise the flag and, and advocate for patients and try to change uh, legislation and try to get this thing recognized when they just disappear. Or when Joni Mitchell, for example, who has publicly claimed that she has Morgellons disease, um, sought treatment, uh, I'm fairly certain. Um, she came out in the Los Angeles Times talking about Morgellons disease, even said she might quit being a musician so she could focus full time on activism and get the medical justice for those suffering from the disease. She just changed her tune completely after that article at some point because uh, I reached out to her several times and, and she was also clear in that she just didn't want to be involved at that point. Now I hope now that the film is out, someone like Mary Lightow or someone like Joni Mitchell or even a, 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 an activist or a high profile uh, celebrity who might be suffering from the disease in secret will come out and help the cause because that's, that's really what um, that that needs to happen. I think everybody can agree on that. Is that um, the world needs to change its prejudice against Morgellons disease, so that the medical industry, when upon hearing the term Morgellons disease in the ER, won't kick someone out, and a dermatologist, when hearing the term Morgellons disease, when a patient walks in the door, won't just shove an antipsychotic at them and not even give them a phys physical exam. There needs to be um, a shrinking of that prejudice, and, and in fact, an inversion of it, so that uh, the understanding of Morgellons disease isn't um, a conspiracy theory like where, where it is on the internet and then you know you have this minority understanding that's actually an infectious disease we need to invert that understanding so that the the fringe understanding is about conspiracy theories and government mind control and the um, prevailing understanding is one of bacterial infection so let's could i also just just quickly make a another point pi is that okay absolutely yeah i'm bringing you up on the screen here might take a minute, but go right ahead. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to to expand a, a, um, on the, the discussion we were having about about patients perhaps displaying um, odd tendencies and just say that again, this is something common that you see across um, patients with, with contested illnesses. And I think that a large part of it uh, emerges from from the the stress of living in a situation where you're not believed constantly um, and where that that kind of climate of disbelief isn't something that you can compartmentalize because it's it's not someone far away it's your own family members or it's your own work colleagues or it's um, people in your your social your social surroundings that have high status like 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 doctors um, and I think that 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 constant need, to prove yourself and to prove that you, you're you're telling the truth as you understand it, that you are a reliable witness to your own your own experience um, over a period of months, turning into years, um, would drive very you know rational, sane, whatever word you want to put on it, um, very level people quite um, crazy and make them say things and do things that, that might, to someone just coming into the situation, um, seem quite outlandish. But I think that, that in a lot of cases, it's almost what well, it is, it's understandable why, why people end up in that position. Absolutely. Here, yeah. let's take a, another question. Or did you have something you wanted to add, Dr. Day? No, I just completely agree with that. I mean, I hear so many stories of patients who have exactly what you're talking about, such little support systems, but it comes down to their own spouse not believing them is extremely mm -hmm. hard to deal with. And um, I mean, some of my patients talk about how their children no longer talk to them and how, I mean, it just destroyed families and relationships. So I can see exactly what you're talking about, about how much of a mental toll it can take on patients. And um, it's, it's like I said, it is so complex is that you see as the social system for patients um, changes or um, as they lack social support um, and the disease progresses, that's where I see mm -hmm. the patients who are in the worst state. Um, definitely when it comes to just the psychosomatic components as well as um, the ability to um, really control their anxiety and their depression and um, even yeah, delusional states. So we've got a, some specific questions coming up here. Can we discuss motility in Morgellon fibers? What about life stages? I've noted at least five distinct life stages. Dr. Day, that sounds like that's uh, that's your purview. Motility um, in Morgellon fibers, bit of a controversial. Right. That yeah, that's that was actually one of my first questions, and what drove me to continue to going to go to the Charles E. Holman Foundation conferences was that there were so many aspects to this disease that I still couldn't understand, or I felt like weren't fully explained. And I know we've been trying to explain that away with um, like electrostatic, electromagnetic type of movement, which I, I observe some of that myself under the microscope. Um, but I don't know if we have quite all of the explanations for this yet. I know. Uh, Marianne was publishing information saying that the filaments themselves can have spiral ketal um, infections inside of them. So I, I don't know if that part of that is driving the movement, but but I think we'll we'll understand more as our research goes on. I'm hoping and in, in the complex understanding the complexity of some of these things that are observed under the microscope or with a with a patient's camera or naked eye, naked eye. Let me hit you with another technical one. It says an FB an a, a Facebook group promotes a protocol called FIRM, F-I-R-M, fenbendazole, who I'm sure I messed that up, and anthelmintic yeah. or worm killer, but it has other effects, iodine, red reishi mushroom, and magnesium oxalate a laxative. Have you heard of this protocol and have you heard of alternative doctors using it? Um, I have heard of the protocol. However, fenbendazole is something that's only used for veterinary use in this country, so I don't know if doctors are really using that protocol. Um, there's protocols similar to that with um, other antiparasitics very similar to a febendazole um, that are on the market for humans. But um, I have had patients reported that they use that um, or have used that in the past, but that's not something that I will prescribe just because it's not in pres or my prescribing. Um, Great. Next question is, mm -hmm. 
Uh, when is the next Morgellons disease scientific study coming out? How soon? When is the new direction or what is the new direction now that the fibers are proven to grow from human skin cells? That's a great question, Lance. Um, when is the next Morgellons scientific study coming out? Um, you know, I, I, that's a good question. I know the Charles E. Holman Foundation is uh, trying to get more and more research out there. I don't know the answer exactly. Marianne Middleveen, um, who was with us shortly but uh, had to run, might have a, an answer about that. Um, I know it's not going to come from the CDC um, unless we can properly motivate them um, to do so. I, I mean, I know a, a lot of you are aware if you saw the film about the CDC study about Mogellans from 2008 to 2012 and um, uh, Randy, Dr. Randy Wymore's take uh, on how they misdefined the Morgellons population by studying people who thought they had fibers in their skin rather than studying people who actually had fibers embedded in their skin. So there's a huge difference, right? Especially if you're delusional about thinking you have something than actually having it. And so the CDC study, which only took 12 samples from skin of people claiming to have Morgellons disease in 2008, uh, <clears throat> that study uh, didn't, it, it showed that those, those samples were, you know, most likely, didn't even say uh, certainly, but were most likely cellulose or cotton uh, based uh, textile fibers. Uh, but that's the reason why, is that they misdefined the actual population they studied. Um, so that, that I think, you know, now with the coronavirus that, that is out there and prevalent right now in, what are we, in April 3rd, 2020, and that's all anyone's thinking about. The silver lining there is that it allows the general population to understand that the CDC, which previously and many times is, is thought of as, previously thought of as infallible, is certainly fallible now, right? The CDC released a whole set of tests for the coronavirus that were, that didn't work. They made a giant mistake, a giant public mistake covered widely by the worldwide press. So now I think everybody in America and perhaps the world can understand that the CDC is run by human beings who make mistakes. They're not 100% of the, they're not 100% right 100% of the time. They make mistakes. And now perhaps we can look back at this CDC study of Morgellons disease and see the mistakes made there rather than trot it out and say, Morgellons disease has to be delusional. The CDC said so, and they're never wrong. We can no longer say that. And I hope that the general population will take another look at that study and ask the CDC to create a new study, which means activism, right? If you want if you're a Morgellons disease patient or a physician who treats it and you want change, you need to be that change. It's really easy to say, hey, someone should really do something about this. We all agree that someone should do something about it. What are you doing daily, weekly to help change the world and make it a better place? What can you do to help organizations like the Charles E. Holman Foundation or, an, or another organization that you deem very beneficial to move things forward and, and, and create activism because activism won't be created without your involvement. It just doesn't happen. So that's my plea to um, folks who send me lots of suggestions on Facebook Messenger or here in the, in the, in the text about what we should do. And I say what, what we should do is, is, is band together. You should uh, participate as well. Open to anyone. What's the most challenging aspect? This is from Jeremy. Um, oh, actually, we we uh, we just kind of covered that. Which is, to, what's the most challenging aspect in gaining universal acceptance of Morgellons disease? I mean, that that was sort of my my spiel is just, is is activism is getting people together to to work as one as they did in the film for just one summer or one one day in May when they marched on the Texas State Capitol uh, together with the Texas Lyme Disease Association. So let me turn it over to Harry or to Dr. Day. What is the most challenging aspect in gaining universal acceptance of Morgellons disease? Um, would you like to go first? Or? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think the most challenging, so, so just to go back to the, the CDC study, I think the most challenging um, f uh, sort of barrier for gaining acceptance is the fact that that study has, has been conducted and the conclusions that, that that study came to because that for 99 percent of, of of doctors performing a literature review or becoming kind of tangentially aware of of Morgellons that will have closed the door 
that will have, have sealed the idea in their head that, that this is 100% a delusional condition that needs to be treated with with antipsychotics. Um, and it's it's difficult to to see past that in the in the sort of short term. And I think the answer is 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 as you say is, is activism. If I can just hop on another question that was asked down there, um, it was uh, how do you think that the history books will be be written about this this disease? And I think that that essentially, uh, if it is if it is proven that long term antibiotics um, are safe and are able to, to, to treat this disease. If this disease is, is, is proven to have a spirochetal origin, then what Morgellons will be, will be at the vanguard of a whole group of diseases um, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, that the narrative and the direction of medical history was changed, not by almost anyone involved in medicine, but by patients and by mass communication and by advocacy and by the internet. Um, and so I think that that it's almost it's almost an old school problem in that you have a the, the only real landmark piece of, of of research as far as people outside of the Morgellons community are concerned is the thing that is is holding you back. But equally, the 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 thing that got you there in the first place is the thing that can move you forward, which is as as you 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 said, advocacy, communication, and 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 compassion. Yeah. Dr. Day, what do you what do you think? Um, it's a disease sometimes that has been accused of being spread by the internet, but could it be something that's also cured by the internet? That's an interesting step. Yeah. Um, well, I'm I, I see that as as I start as I continue to practice, I do see that there are more clinicians who are on board with the idea that this can be related to a a disease process, as Mary Ann Middleveen and Raphael Stricker published publications that are found in resources like PubMed, um, it does get the attention of um, clinicians. And um, now there are even dermatologists in my area who are willing to work with patients and really do see the connection to Lyme disease and Bartonella and co-infections. So, um, it's a, it's a slow process though, and it's really taking it to, to, to the individual level of the physician to really educate themselves at this point, um, which I think would change if the CDC were to recognize it and make in it for the disease to make its way into medical education. Um, when I proposed the fact that I wanted to um, try to educate my peers when I was in medical school about the condition, at that point in time, I was told that I needed to present the CDC's view on the disease. and. I would have rather just not talked about it than to present the CDC view of disease to peers. So um, I think when we get to the point where, where there's a different stance from the CDC, then there'll be further education and opportunity to really converse about this as um, professionals. And also, also get the insurance companies behind this. That's a big problem too, is uh, you know, the CDC partnered with Kaiser, one of the largest insurance companies in find their findings that this isn't associated to anything but a psychiatric condition. And that's a real disservice to the patient when they're trying to get insurance coverage for treatments that could actually help. Here's a question here uh, from Trish. I understand the treatment is long-term antibiotics as in several years. Is the idea that we get rid of co-infections, the symptoms of more, uh, is the idea that as we get rid of co-infections, the symptoms of Morgellons lessen? And have you had anyone reach full remission with long-term antibiotics? It sounds like the vast majority of people stay on them indefinitely. Um, you can talk. You can you can revisit some of our Q and A's, Trish, uh, with Edward Hu, who talked about how his antibiotics brought him into full remission. Um, at the end of the film, Skin Deep, uh, Cindy Casey talks about how she still has to take antibiotics um, just to keep at about 80% well, and she hasn't seemed to have ever gone into full remission, but if she stops the antibiotics, like all hell breaks loose, uh, symptom-wise. Um, Dr. Day, what, are you, what is your thought? 
I have had patients go into full remission, but not all patients. And I think there's a variety of factors. Um, but the ones that do go into full remission, obviously, they, they're so celebratory about it that um, they start to become my biggest fans. And um, try. To, I remember one of them actually volunteered to be on the Q&A tonight just because he wanted to... <laughs> Um, let other patients know that it is possible. So um, yeah, I do see it. And, and I agree with you that uh, some of these remissions have been faster than I thought they would be by really trying to approach Bartonella as one of the co-infections. And that's not the case for everyone, but um, I am really hopeful, especially when I'm getting a patient in my door who um, has not, hasn't had this for at least, you know, decades that that's when it gets a little bit harder i think to really approach this and get someone full into full remission in a reasonable time but um, for my patients who are um, more early on to discover what's wrong with them um, i have seen a full remission in a matter of months even sometimes so it's it's been remarkable there's a question here from lance how many more Jones disease patients are there is there a patient registry we need one or we need it to be reported by whomever has the data from the patient registry, please let's get a report on this. So I know there is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Day, there is a patient registry through the Charles E. Holman Morgellons Disease Foundation. Uh, and I, you can visit their website in two places. It's at morgellonsdisease.org, but the main website that you'll wanna visit is the cehf.org. So T-H-E-C-E-H-F, not chef, C-H-E-F, but cehf.org. Uh, the Charles E. Holman Morgellons Disease Foundation. It's a big, uh, it's a mouthful, and it's also got tons of information. And they have a registry there. Um, you can you can join it. I'm pretty sure it's anonymous. It's not like you need to worry about um, uh, being identified. But it's trying to get much like LymeDisease.org patients centered registry. It's trying to get a, an idea of how many people have it and what the geographical breakdown is. Uh, here's a question. Well, Lance, you got a lot of questions. How many babies are born with Morgellons disease infection caused by mothers with Morgellons disease infection? So how, what about congenital um, uh, infection, Dr. Day? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I think that there, that's part of the reason why um, or, or good evidence that Spren brought up against the disease being a delusional disease is the fact that there has been congenital cases or even if you think about the, fir the first case, it was in a very young boy. So um, yeah, I don't know if we have great statistics on that. Um, I think Dr. Stricker and would be the one who would be following the cases the most just because that's what he does in his practice. Um, I do see some um, women through pregnancy um, but I do refer to specialists like Dr. Stricker usually to also oversee those cases. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at this point in time, um, we're not really doing an, a great job of testing um, necessarily in all cases or have the test really even adequate enough to determine this um, for um, infants. So. That, that's a really good question, and I'm, I'm always concerned when I have a patient who had symptoms before they had children or are pregnant with symptoms um, that, that they could possibly be in the family because I do see, do see cases like that. It's interesting. I, I, there is a, I have an anecdotal example, someone who contacted me. She had Morgellons, and um, uh, she had a baby, and the baby apparently has Morgellons as well. So anecdotally, I can offer that. Right. Um, and I can also sort of offer that what, what happened in January and February with the CDC, I think they said um, in January it was, uh, this isn't in the case of Lyme disease. So they said Lyme disease was not a congenital, transmission could not be congenital. It couldn't be between the mother and, and their child, right? Couldn't give Lyme disease. Right. That was January 2020. But in February 2020, they said, you know what, you can actually. So... Um, medicine evolves, right? right? Our understanding of how pathogens work and disease works evolves. So bear that in mind as you get answers. Um, for the most part, uh, you know, general medical information is great. And then there are these exceptions. Um, 
and you know chronic Lyme disease is certainly in that category of an exceptional disease that is misunderstood and struggling to be understood and uh, the contested illnesses that Harry studies as well. Um, and Morgellons disease is one as well. So, and, and, and I think if you remember in the film, um, Edward talks to his brother, Brian Hu, who's a doctor, who had originally thought Edward was just needed psychiatric help. And that was it. Um, and he said, look, you know, brother Brian, you know, you as doctors, you guys do a great job. 99% of the time you're helping people, you're saving people, you're doing a great job, but then there's just 1% of cases, man, and we just get devastated. And and that's what we're talking about, uh, to leave leave your mind open to f to hear exceptions to the rule, medical industry. That's what we're talking about. Um, here's a quick question from Lance again. He's the number one question answer. Uh, question asker. Thank you, Lance. Is there a body cream we can apply to the skin to stop the fibers from growing and moving? Uh, Dr. Day, is there, are there other topical solutions to Morgellons disease? Um, there are things that help. I wouldn't say that there's a, a topical cure-all for Morgellons disease. Um, I know that there are advertised um, remedies. I think you touched on that of how many um, things you'll see advertised for as a cure for Morgellons, but really I, the reason why I approach it as a um, systemic disease and illness is because um, I do see the most, um, at least lasting effects in um, transfer remission happening when approaching it as such and not just using topical agents. Although that being said, I do see some um, topical treatments really helping. Um, I could go into into them, but there are so many that um, it would take a long time, both natural and conventional treatments, just kind of touching on the point that there's not one treatment that helps everyone. So part of the reason why I try to take a long time with my patients and understand what's really happening with them so that I can pick the best agents that I think that would help them the most. Um, but I, I, but yeah, just a universal topical cure-all, I, I don't know of one. Here's another question, changing the gears a little bit. Um, it's from Trish. Is the CDC withholding the truth behind chronic Lyme disease because of money? And why are they denying this illness? Never mind Morgellons. Um, that's a that's a great question. I think, you know, if you look at a film like Under Our Skin, it, it explores that um, and the conflict of interests that lie there. I would recommend that film. Um, as far as Morgellons disease, um, when I've been researching it, a lot of times people will say, you know, I follow the money, okay? That's where you're gonna find the answers is in the money. It's a money thing. And that's a fairly trite answer that I don't think applies to Morgellons disease. And, and, and I'll pass it over to you, Harry, in a minute to talk about this because I know you've studied more than just this contested illness. But in, in I, I don't think, it does, I mean, there's no money to be made, you know, um, denying Morgellons disease uh, or very little money to be made as far as it's such a rare disease that it's, um, I don't, I don't see the motivation personally there. Um, but I do see a human instinct to want to be right. And I see a human instinct in, within, uh, particularly within doctors who have spent years of their life studying and paying lots of money to go to medical school to get that certificate and to have that knowledge. And they don't like to be corrected. A lot of folks don't like to be challenged, especially after they've so educated, much more educated than you, you know, much more, uh, they spent much more money on their education and they've spent years, you know, just, just like toughing it out at the residency to, to get to where they are and have you come in and have these crazy ideas about a new disease. The arrogance can take over. And I think it's a human instinct, right? And particularly when you're in a position of authority to just be presented with something that doesn't make sense and a victim blame. And I think that is more, from my personal point of view, more prevalent and, and a better reason why Morgellons is denied uh, than um, a profit-oriented motive. I just don't, I don't see it uh, as far as money goes. But uh, Harry, what do you think about, about the uh, Morgellons disease and uh, chronic Lyme and other contested illnesses and, and the, the motivation that a, an organization or doctors might have in denying them? Yeah, no, no, I, I would mainly just echo exactly exactly what you've said um if there was some kind of um over-the-counter 
medication for this. The the the, the demographics of, of Morgellons patients that that we know um, tend to be middle aged, tend to be in Western countries. That is a, a, a demographic that is already a target market for for a ton of pharmaceutical companies that are looking to make make money by by um, producing drugs. Um, so if anything, the the kind of money motivation would, would skew towards why are people not investigating this in order to make to make money out of the patient community. Um, and when you then take into account the fact that there are there are plenty of countries where that that money motivation is, is almost out, out of the uh, the window, countries like the UK or, or, or Europe or, or Canada, where you have kind of um, state sponsored uh research state sponsored healthcare systems um the insurance question isn't isn't really an, an an issue um i i don't tend towards the the conspiratorial with this kind of thing i tend to more towards the medicine is is a uh, a fairly conservative um beast as as a whole and that that for the most part as you say the the, the kind of expression within the sociology of science is is that that scientists are working on normal science. Um, so every however many years, every 10 years, every 15 years, every 20 years, there is a scientific revolution within an area of science that recalibrates um, how people look at things. Um, and once that recalibration has taken place, then scientists just work on solving the individual problems within that paradigm, the individual problems um, that are presented by that that worldview and things outside of that worldview are, are not problems at all because they they don't exist they don't they don't really feature as 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 a way of explaining the phenomena um, and then when this kind of gets disseminated in a sort of um, institutional sense so as 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 you're saying the 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 medical training that people receive the uh, legitimacy that is tied up in their judgment, in their professional judgment, in the way that they have viewed patients for 10, 20, 30 years, um, changing the minds of, of those individuals. And those are the individuals who are kind of on the forefront in, in terms of seeing patients um, is is very, very difficult. And uh, probably rightly, they are skeptical because it's in their professional interest to be skeptical. That is, that is what doctors are supposed to be they're supposed to to go to the most obvious most explainable explanation first and then work backwards and unfortunately with Morgellons patients what that means is that they go to the biggest uh, most well-known study and the explanation that fits in most neatly with all their other understandings of of um, delusions of parasitosis and and and, and that's why they, they arrive at, at, at that and getting them to shift beyond that is very difficult because their, their instinct is always to go um, for the first, the, the the first most obvious answer. There's there's an expression um, that if if you hear um, hooves think horses, don't think zebras, um, and and that kind of sums up because because every now and then there will be a zebra, if that that isn't stretching the metaphor too too much. <laughs> I was actually uh, blamed for that in medical school, that I was too interested in the zebras and that I really needed yeah. to learn my horses. <laughs> and uh, I even was told that um, part of the reason why we couldn't talk about Morgellons in dermatology was it wasn't one of the top 200 conditions. And we are only allowed to learn the top 200 conditions because mm -hmm. that's what we'd be seeing in our primary care practices. I want to say just something quick about um, conspiracy theory, uh, because I, I've had an interesting uh, experience with it by uh, in two areas. One, investigating Morgellons disease. There are tons of conspiracy theories about it. Um, you know, most the coolest because I like conspiracy theories. Don't get me wrong. Like I think they're neat and they're really cool in movies. Um, and the one that I think is coolest for Morgellons disease is when like the government wants to control your mind, so they fly planes over. They use chemtrails to drop down nanotechnology into your skin that goes into your skin and then it goes into your brain and then and then controls your mind. Now I think that's super cool, but I don't believe it as a as an actual like financially viable mind control um, project that the government would do. It just it's just too out, it's way too outlandish for me, and. And I don't believe in very many conspiracy theories at all, but I used to. Um, and, uh, you know, just like most people, you hear so many of them that you figure some of them got to be true. And 
I, uh, as an editor, that's what I do uh, every day is I edit television and, and documentaries and film. Um, as an editor, years ago, I got a job on a, on a show that, that studied conspiracy theories, that went into in-depth conspiracy theories. And as I was getting ready to edit the show, I, I started getting copies of the season that had come previous to mine that I was about to edit. And I started watching them and I was like, whoa, these are cool. You know, it was like, like the secret layer below the, uh, the Denver airport and like, you know, all these amazing conspiracies. And I thought, well, it seems like, cause I know, I know reality television and I know how they can, we can exaggerate things and I kind of can see it. And, and I thought, well, this is probably about, about 70% true, but I'll bet like 30% is just exaggerated to make it cool for TV. And I went and started working there and I, and I adjusted my ratio of truth and exaggeration from 70% true and 30% exaggeration to um, 5% true and 95% exaggeration. Because the way conspiracy theories work is, is they take a tiny truth and then you find the worst case scenario that could happen because of that truth. And then you look at that scenario and you take and extrapolate the next worst case scenario until you come up with a really elaborate conspiracy theory. And I, and I actually did that for a living and, and regret having done that because while it was fun and neat to do for television, it actually gave people an under, a false understanding of how say the police for the police state works, which it was, you know, 95% false. And, and, um, and we told ourselves it was for entertainment, but it, 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 it can have some negative effects. And, and I see that within the conspiracy theory world. So I, 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 I encourage you to, to really not believe most conspiracy theories and never take one at face value, because even though you will, f there are every once in a while, a real conspiracy don't let that be the rule. That's the total exception. And um, I just want to say that I, I looked pretty hard to find a conspiracy theory here in Morgellons disease, because honestly, if there were one, it would make this movie a lot more popular. And I would have exploited that to the hilt and been very happy to find the conspiracy theory and expose it. Uh, but I just didn't find one. So turning back to the questions here, uh, here's a quick one. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll take uh, just three more questions tonight. Uh, number three here. Uh, this is from Molly Hasty, uh, one of the participants in our documentary. Thank you, Molly. Dr. Day, how many patients are you currently treating for Morgellons? Um, I think that the, well, that's actually a really good question. Um, uh, I know I have over 100 patients actively, I believe, um, but uh, the total count that I've seen in my practice, I'm not quite sure. I was actually thinking that I wish I took better statistics on that um, because I have so many patients that do have um, Lyme disease. I do, and I specialize in Morgellons. I, I, I would say that I have more than your average Lyme practice. Um, but at the same time, some of my patients, we don't even discover that they have Morgellons even though I do what I do until later on in, in their treatment. So um, I, I haven't been making a huge, uh, I haven't been doing as good of a job as I should be, I guess, in keeping statistics. Um, but yeah, hundreds at this point. And there's a dermatologist in town too, who I share patients with. And I know that he has also hundreds of patients in his practice. Um, and that's mostly patients, um, at least in his practice from the Portland area. So it gives you a good idea that this is a, um, uh, probably something that's um, at larger um, or more people that could be potentially diagnosed than there are currently. Let me ask you a quick question. Uh, this is from Tracy. Um, you know, we talked about congenital uh, transmission possibly. What about uh, casual contact? Is Morgellons contagious? Um, that's a good question. So it, it doesn't appear that there's just contag the contagious aspect from casual contact. Um, uh, so I know a lot of patients do have that fear that they're contagious and that they don't want to inflict the disease upon others. Um, but uh, what I usually am, am looking for if, if a patient is contagious is is if they have an actual active vector. So something like a body lice that we know can spread relapse fever, that's when I'm more concerned and will take more precautions um, with the patient 
potentially being contagious to um, even myself as a doctor or others. Um, so, uh, but that's, you know, that's actually the minority of patients that I find have something going on, like actual, you know, ulcers of body lice at the time. Um, but we do know that those are some of the potential ways that these diseases can spread, such as um, relapsing fever and Bartonella, like I mentioned. So it is on my radar, um, but I don't think that a patient's just going to spread this casually. Um, I'm more concerned about uh, bloodborne um, uh, transmission and sexual transmission. Well, what about sexual transmission? Is that something that's been um, recorded? Um, well, I know that um, this is something that's been very much debated is, um, and we don't really have that, I don't think, accurate studies to know um, transmission, but we do know that um, uh, you can find uh, the bacteria in secretions, vaginal secretions and semen. And so I, I think that's always good to take precaution, especially when I do hear stories of um, entire family members being affected um, and there wasn't a clear exposure of the entire family so to consider that could be a possible route. And like you said, we just confirmed that just very recently that um, congenital spread is possible. So um, I, I like to keep an open mind and just, I think, be safe rather than sorry. For the final question, uh, Lance, going back to our great question answer, a question asker, Lance, it's uh, when can we expect to see Skin Deep Part Two? Uh, Morgellons is finally validated by the CDC. That's a great subtitle, by the way. Um, that's a gr that's a great question. I would love to do another film, and in fact, we are going to do a couple short more uh, a couple of more short films this year. Um, one about Marianne Middleveen and, and sort of delving into a, a bit more of the science, giving a, big, a deeper dive there. Um, uh, another film we're going to do um, about two couples that we filmed at the Morgellons Conference. Each of the wives had been put into psychiatric facilities by the husbands, and each of those wives separately by their uh, psychiatrists had been deemed to be not psychiatrically affected there or i mean not to have a psychiatric source to their problem they were told you know you guys have a, some kind of biological infection you need to get out of the psychiatric institution and so when they were discharged the husbands both of them felt it horrible and then mm -hmm. very supportive and took with and went with the wives to the morgellons conference in austin and we actually had both sets of couples sit down and talk so we're gonna we'll cover that conversation it's very interesting and kind of heartbreaking but also heartwarming uh to see how they come together and support each other um, and then uh, we'll do a profile on Nancy Egger as well, is one of the, who's one of the um, Morgellons Disease Foundation uh, volunteers who's very active and I think with us today. Hello, Nancy. Um, and then as far as a follow-up movie, I, I would say if something happens where other scientists around the world begin to repeat the experiments that um, Raphael Stricker and Marianne Middleveen and other um, Morgellons disease researchers are doing and are covered in the film and get the same results, then I think that might change the world and I will cover that. If activism on your part, on the part of the Morgellons uh, uh, patients and physicians who treat it, starts to coalesce and create political theater that's interesting and changing people's minds, I can cover that. So if the material starts to exist, that's when Skin Deep Part 2, or Jellens is finally validated by the CDC, will come out. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who joined us. Thank you for your questions. I uh, wish we could talk more, but um, thank you for your, your chats and your participation. And for those of you who supported the film over the years through the Kickstarter campaign or just through some inspirational uh, Facebook messages, thank you so much. And I want to thank our, our guest speakers, uh, Dr. Courtney Day and Dr. Harry Quinshaw. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And if you want to see this, you can play it back here on uh, crowdcast.io slash pyware. You can also see our other Q&As. You can also see these on Facebook Live. Uh, that will be posted to the Skin Deep uh, Battle Over Morgellons Facebook page, and you can find out more information at a couple of places at morgellonsmovie.org, and that's where you could buy the film and see uh, news updates about our film. And you can also find out more about Morgellons disease at a few sites. The one I recommend would be 
the Charles E. Holman Morgellons Disease Foundation at the CEHF.org. And you can also check out Dr. Day's uh, website at dailywellness.com, D A Y L Y wellness.com. Thanks, everybody. Adios.